welcome back to story time so as you can see i changed the background since it is officially the new year it's officially not december uh, we went with this and i just realized i'm gonna have to change the dollar amount uh color and the starting color on my goals because you can't really see that it says 130 there so that's my bad but anyways um I decided to go with this background the no well what I assume is but it's just a generic note from the Scarlet Pimpernel himself and this little flower shape in the corner is his little telltale uh, sign his send-off it is a Pimpernel flower and written in scarlet ink so yeah if uh, you remember last we left off Marguerite had been uh, given the ultimatum that either she find the Scarlet Pimpernel which she has um, become uh, begin to idolize or she uh, or her brother will die because he is um, working against the radical uh, movement that is putting all the aristocrats, including women and children, to death. So, uh, yeah, which means, of course, that he will be put to death if he is not, uh, you know, if she doesn't cave under the demands of, I forget, Chauvelin, something like that. Chauvelin, I was close. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. We will hide my little meowing maestro. Chapter 11, Lord Grenville's Ball. The historic ball given by the then Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Lord Grenville, was the most brilliant function of the year. Though the autumn season had only just begun, everybody who was anybody had contrived to be in London in time to be present there and to shine at this ball to the best of his or her respective ability. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, had promised to be present. He was coming on presently from the opera. Lord Grenville himself had listened to the two first acts of Orpheus before preparing to receive his guests. At ten o'clock, an unusually late hour in those days, the grand rooms of the foreign office, exquisitely decorated with exotic palms and flowers, were, over, were filled to overflowing. One room had been set apart for dancing, and the dainty strains of the minuet made a soft accompaniment to the gay clatter chatter. Oh, thank you so much for the follow. Hi, you're, how are you doing, Kiesel? How do you pronounce that? I'm just going to put Maestro up here. Is it Kiesel? Is it Kiesel? Kiesel? Just so that I can get the pronunciation right. Uh, and don't worry about, um, we're in the third part of the Scarlet Temper now, but don't worry, I do have all of uh, my previous streams on my YouTube. Uh, let me get that. I swear I can spell. <laughs> That's right there. So I have them all in... Um, playlist form so you don't have to worry about finding the next video anything like that uh, but to catch you up to speed uh, in the scarlet pimpernel it's set during the uh the height of the french revolution when all the aristocrats were uh being beheaded and uh this mysterious character named the scarlet pimpernel who nobody knows who it is is uh leads an organization of English who are saving some of the aristocrats from uh, death, especially like the, the women and children, and bringing them over to London. And he always leaves a note for the, uh, the authorities in France to find, you know, saying, oh, I was this person, uh, you know, leaving or whatever. And then he leaves this little uh, scarlet flower in the corner, of a flower called a pimpernel. And uh, Lady Marguerite, who is, uh, she was part of 
French society and then married a baron or something like that in England named Sir Percy. She has been given the ultimatum by an old friend who is very high up in the radical revolutionists and her brother has been found out for being a traitor and he is in danger of being put to death unless she can find the Scarlet Pimpernel and sell him out to the revolutionists or revolutionaries. I don't remember. I think they were called uh, Republicans because they, you know, were they're part of the Republic of France. Yeah. Um, but also, I'd like to give you a little introduction to myself. I am Sunny. I do story times. I also do some game streams and a little bit of art streams here and there. All of my art is there and here are all of my links to my socials. And I am also very into cats. As you can tell, I have a lot of cat art. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, continue. And if you wanted to, uh, like, you know, say something in chat, I will get caught up at chapter breaks. And I just started in the new chapter, so. All right. So whenever this guy is showing, this is Maestro, um, that means that I'm chatting between chapters. And when he goes away, I am reading. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, had promised to be present. He was coming on presently from the opera. Lord Grenville himself had listened to the first two acts of Orpheus before preparing to receive his guests. At ten o'clock, an unusually late hour in those days, the grand rooms of the foreign office, exquisitely decorated with exotic palms and flowers, were filled to overflowing. One room had been set apart for dancing, and the dainty strains of the minuet made a soft accompaniment to the gay clatter, the merry laughter of the numerous and brilliant company. In a smaller chamber, facing the top of the fine stairway, the distinguished host stood ready to receive his guests. Distinguished men, beautiful women, not uh, nobil uh, notabilities, from every European country, had already filed past him, had exchanged the elaborate bows and curtsies with him, which the extravagant fashion of the time demanded, and then, laughing and talking, had dispersed in the ball, reception, and card rooms beyond. Not far from Lord Grenville's elbow, leaning against one of the console tables, Chauvelin, in his uh, irreproachable black costume, was taking a quiet survey of the brilliant throng. He noted that Sir Percy and Lady Blakeney had not yet arrived, and his keen, pale eyes glanced quickly towards the door every time a newcomer approached, appeared. He stood somewhat isolated. The envoy of the revolutionary government of France was not likely to be very popular in England, at a time when the news of the awful September massacres and of the reign of terror and anarchy had just begun to filtrate across the channel. In his official capacity, he had been received courteously by his English colleagues. Mr. Pitt had shaken him by the hand. Lord Grenville had entertained him more than once, but the more intimate circles of London society ignored him altogether. The women openly turned their backs upon him. The men, who held no official position, refused to shake his hand. But Chauvelin was not the man to trouble himself about these social amenities, which he called mere incidents in his diplomatic career. He was blindly enthusiastic for the revolutionary cause, he despised all social inequity, inequalities, and he had a burning love for his own country. These three sentiments made him supremely indifferent to the snubs he received in the fog-ridden lo uh, loyalists old-fashioned England. Oh, in the fog-ridden, loyalist, old-fashioned England. But above all, Chauvelin had a purpose at heart. He firmly believed that the French aristocrat was the most bitter enemy of France. He would have wished to see every one of them annihilated. He was one of those who, during his awful, this awful reign of terror, had been the first to utter the historic and ferocious desire that aristocrats might have but one head between them, so that it might be cut off with a single stroke of the guillotine. 
and thus he looked upon every French aristocrat who had succeeded in escaping from France as so much prey of which the guillotine had been unwarrantedly cheated, uh, unwarrantably cheated. There was no doubt that those royalists émigrés, once they had managed to cross the frontier, did their very best to stir up foreign indignation against France. Plots without end were hatched in England, in Belgium, in Holland, to try and induce some great power to send troops into revolutionary Paris, to free King Louis, and to summarily hang the bloodthirsty leaders of that monster republic. Small wonder, therefore, that the romantic and mysterious personality of the Scarlet Pimpernel was a source of bitter hatred to Chauvelin. He and the few young Japanese, uh, jackanapes under his command, well furnished with money, armed with boundless daring and acute cunning, had succeeded in rescuing hundreds of aristocrats from France. Nine-tenths of the émigrés, who were feted at the English course, uh, court, owed their safety to that man and to his league. Chauvelin had sworn to his colleagues in Paris that he would discover the identity of that meddlesome Englishman, entice him over to France, and then Chauvelin drew a deep breath of satisfaction at the very thought of seeing that enigmatic head falling under the knife of the guillotine as easily as that of any other man. Suddenly, there was a great stir on the handsome staircase. All conversation stopped for a moment, as the Major Domo's voice outside announced, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, and the sweet, uh, sweet Sir Percy Blakeney, Lady Blakeney. Lord Granville went quickly to the door to receive his exalted guest. The Prince of Wales, dressed in a magnificent court suit of salmon-colored velvet richly embroidered, with gold, entered with Marguerite Blakeney on his arm, and on his left, Sir Percy, in gorgeous, shimmering cream satin, cut in the extravagant incroyable style, his fair hair free from powder, priceless lace at his neck and wrists, and the flat chapeau bras under his arm. After the few conversational words of deferential greeting, Lord Granville said to his royal guest, Will your highness permit me to introduce Monsieur Chauvelin, the accredited agent of the French government? Chauvelin immediately, the prince, eh, uh, Chauvelin immediately, the prince entered, had stepped forward, expecting his introduction. He bowed very low, whilst the prince returned his salute with a curt nod of his head. Monsieur, said his royal highness coldly, you will try to forget the government that sent you, and look upon you merely as our guest, a private gentleman from France. As such, you are welcome, monsieur. Monseigneur, rejoined Chauvelin, uh, Chauvelin, bowing once again. Madame, he added, bowing ceremoniously before Marguerite. Ah, my little Chauvelin, she said with unconcerned gaiety, and extending her tiny hand to him. Monsieur and I are old friends, your royal highness. Ah, then, said the prince, this time very graciously, you are doubly welcome, monsieur. There is something else I would crave permission to present to your royal highness, here interloped Lord Grenville. Ah, who is it? asked the prince. Madame la Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive and her family, who have but recently come from France. By all means, they are among the lucky ones, then. Lord Granville turned in search of the Comtesse, who sat at the further end of the room. Lord love me, whispered his royal highness to Marguerite, as soon as he had caught sight of the rigid figure of the old lady. Lord love me, she looks very virtuous and very melancholy. Faith, your royal highness, she rejoined with a smile. Virtue is like pre uh, precious odours most fragment when it is crushed. Virtue, alas, sighed the prince, is mostly unbecoming to your charming sex, madame. Madame la Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive, said Lord Granville, introducing the lady. 
This is my pleasure, madame. My royal father, as you know, is ever glad to welcome those of your compatriots whom France has driven from her shores. Your royal highness is very gracious, replied the comtesse with becoming dignity. Then, indicting her daughter, who stood timidly by her side, my daughter Suzanne, monseigneur, she said. Ah, charming, charming, said the prince. And now allow me, comtesse, to introduce you, Lady Blakeney, who honors us with her friendship. You and she will have much to say to one another, I vow. Every compatriot of Lord Lady Blakeney's is doubly welcome for her sake. Her friends are our friends, her enemies the enemies of England. Marguerite's blue eyes had twinkled with merriment at this gracious speech from her exalted friend. The Comtesse de Tournay, who lately had so flagrantly insulted her, was here receiving a public lesson at which Marguerite could not help but rejoice. But the Comtesse, for whom respect of loyal, uh, royalty amounted almost to a religion, was too well schooled in courtly etiquette to show the slightest sign of embarrassment as the two ladies curtsied ceremoniously to one another. His Royal Highness is ever gracious, madame, said Marguerite demurely, and with a wealth of mischief in her twinkling blue eyes. But here there is no need for this kind of his kind mediation. Your amiable reception of me at our last meeting still dwells pleasantly in my memory. We poor exiles, madame, rejoined the Comtesse frigidly, show our gratitude to England by devotion to the wishes of Monseigneur. Madame, said Marguerite with another uh, ceremonious curtsy. Madame, responded the Comtesse with equal dignity. The prince, in the meanwhile, was saying a few gracious words to the young vicomte. I am happy to know you, Miss, uh, Monsieur le Vicomte, he said. I knew your father, well, he, uh, when he was ambassador in London. Ah, Monseigneur, replied the Vicomte, I was a little boy then, and now I owe the honor of this meeting to our protector, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Hush, said the prince, earnestly and quickly, as he indicated Chauvelin, who had stood a little on one side, throughout the whole of this little scene, watching Marguerite and the Comtesse with an amused, sarcastic little smile round his thin lips. Nay, Monseigneur, he said now, as if in direct response to the Prince's challenge, pray do not check this gentleman's display of gratitude. The name of that interesting red flower is well known to me, and to France. The Prince looked at him keenly for a moment or two. Faith, then, Mon uh, monsieur, he said, perhaps you know more about our national hero than we do ourselves. Perhaps you know who he is. See, he added, turning to the group round the room, the ladies hang upon your lips. You would render yourself popular among the fair sex if you were to gratify their curiosity. Ah, monsieur, said Chauvelin significantly. Rumor has it in France that your highness could, and you would, give the truest account of that enigmatical wayside flower. He looked quickly and keenly at Marguerite as he spoke, but she betrayed no emotion, and her eyes met his quite fearlessly. Nay, man, replied the prince, my lips are sealed, and the members of the League jealously guard the secret of their chief. So his fair adorers have to be content with worshipping a shadow. Here in England, monsieur, he added with wonderful charm and dignity, we but name the Scarlet Pimpernel, and every fair cheek is suffused with a blush of enthusiasm. None have seen him save his faithful lieutenants. We know not if he be tall or short, fair or dark, handsome or ill-formed, but we know that he is the bravest gentleman in all the world, and we all feel a little proud, monsieur, when we remember that he is an Englishman. Ah, monsieur Chauvelin, added Marguerite, looking almost with defiance across at the placid, sphinx-like face of the Frenchman. His 
His Royal Highness should add that we ladies think of him as of a hero of old. We worship him. We wear his badge. We tremble for him when he is in danger and exult with him in the hour of his victory. Chauvelin did no more than bow placidly both to the prince and to Marguerite. He felt that both speeches were intended, each in their way, to convey contempt or defiance. The pleasure-loving, idle prince he despised, a beautiful woman who in her golden hair wore a spray of small red flowers composed of rubies and diamonds. Her he held in the hollow of his head, uh, of his hand. He could afford to remain silent and to wait events. A long, jovial, inane laugh broke the sudden silence which had fallen over everybody. And we poor husbands, came in slow, affected accents from gorgeous Sir Percy. We have to stand by, <laughs> while they worship, a demmed shadow. Everyone laughed, the prince more loudly than anyone. The tension was of subdued excitement, was uh, relieved, and the next moment everyone was laughing and chatting merrily as the gay crowd broke up and dispersed in the adjoining rooms. Chapter 12 The Scrap of Paper Marguerite suffered intensely, though she laughed and chatted, though she wore a uh, she was more admired, more surrounded, more feted than any woman there. She felt like one condemned to death living her last day upon this earth. Her nerves were in a state of painful tension, which had increased a hundredfold during that brief hour which she had spent in her husband's company between the opera and the ball. The short ray of hope that she felt uh, that she might find in his this good-natured, lazy individual, a valuable friend and adviser, had vanished as quickly as it had come, the moment she found herself alone with him. The same feeling of good-humored contempt which one feels for an animal or a faithful servant made her turn away with a smile from the man who should have been her moral support in uh, this heart-rending crisis through which she was passing, who she should have been her, uh, who should have been her cool-headed adviser, when feminine sympathy and sentiment tossed her thither, and uh, hither and thither, between her love for her brother, who was uh, far away and in mortal peril, and horror of the awful service which Chauvelin had exacted for from her, in exchange for Armand's safety. There he stood, the moral support, the cool-headed adviser, surrounded by a crowd of brainless, empty-headed young fops, who were even now repeating from mouth to mouth, and with every sign of the keenest enjoyment, a doggerel quatrain uh, which he had just given forth. Everywhere the absurd, silly words met her. People seemed to have little else to speak about. Even the prince, who asked her with a laugh whether she appreciated her husband's latest poetic efforts. All done in the try and tying of a cravat, Sir Percy had declared it uh, to his clique of admirers. We seek him here. We seek him there. Those Frenchies seek him everywhere. Is he in heaven? Is he in hell? <laughs> that damned elusive pimpernel. Sir Percy's bon mot had gone the round of the brilliant reception rooms. The prince was enchanted. He vowed that life without Blakeney would be but a dreary desert. Then, taking him by the arm, he led him to the card room and engaged him in a long game of hazard. Sir Percy, whose chief interest in those social gatherings seemed to center round the card table, usually allowed his wife to flirt, dance, to amuse or bore herself as uh, much as she liked. And tonight, having delivered herself of this bon mot, he had left Marguerite surrounded by a crowd of admirers of all ages, all anxious and willing to help her to forget that somewhere in the spacious reception rooms there was a long, lazy being 
who had been fool enough to suppose that the cleverest woman in Europe would settle down to the prosaic bonds of English matrimony. Her still overwrought nerves, her excitement and agitation, lent a beautiful uh, Marguerite Blakeney much additional charm, escorted by a veritable bevy of men of all ages and of most nationalities. She called forth many exclamations of admiration from everyone as she passed. She would not allow herself any more time to think. Her early, somewhat bohemian training had made her somewhat of a, fat, a fatalist. She felt that events would shape themselves, that the directing of them was not in her hands. From Chauvelin, she knew that she could not ex uh, that she could expect no mercy. He had set a price upon Armand's head and left it to her to pay or not as she chose. Later on in the evening, she caught sight of Sir Andrew Fulkes and Lord Antony Dewhurst, uh, uh, ah. Lord Antony Dewhurst, who seemingly had just arrived. She noticed at once that Sir Andrew immediately made for little Suzanne de Tournay, and that the two young people soon managed to isolate themselves in one of the deep embrasures of the mullioned windows there to carry on a long conversation, who seemed very earnest and very pleasant on both sides. Both the young men looked a little haggard and anxious, but otherwise they were irreproachably dressed, and there was not the slightest sign about their courtly demeanour, of the terrible catastrophe which they must have felt hovering round them and round their chief. That the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel had... Uh, no intention of abandoning its cause, she had gathered through little Suzanne herself, who spoke openly of the assurance she and her mother had had that the Comte de Tournay would be rescued from France by the League within the next few days. Faintly she began to wonder, as she looked at the brilliant and fashionable crowd in the gaily lighted ballroom, which of these worldly men round her was the mysterious Scarlet Pimpernel who held the threads of such daring plots and the fate of valuable lives in his hands. A burning curiosity seized her to know him, although for months she had heard of him and had accepted his anonymity, as everyone else in society had done. But now she longed to know, quite impersonally, quite apart from Armand, and, oh, quite apart from Chauvelin, only for her own sake, for the sake of the enthusiastic admiration she had always bestowed on his bravery and cunning. He was at the ball, of course, somewhere, since Sir Andrew Foulkes and Lord Antony Dewhurst were here, evidently expecting to meet their chief, and perhaps to get a fresh mot d'ordeur from him. A uh, word of order, I guess. Marguerite looked round at everyone, at the aristocratic, high-typed Norman faces, the squarely built, fair-haired Saxon, and more gentle, humorous cast of the Celt, wondering which of these betrayed the power, the energy, the cunning which had imposed its will and its leadership upon a number of high-born English gentlemen, among whom, rumor asserted, was His Royal Highness himself. Sir Andrew Foulkes? Surely not. With his gentle blue eyes, which were looking so tenderly and longingly after little Suzanne, who was being led away from the, the pleasant tête-à-tête -tête by her stern mother. Marguerite watched him across the room, as he finally turned away with a sigh and seemed to stand aimless and lonely, knowing that Suzanne, uh, now that Suzanne's dainty little figure had disappeared in the crowd. She watched him as he strolled towards the doorway, which led to a small boudoir beyond, then paused and leaned against the framework of it, looking still anxiously all round him. Marguerite contrived for the moment to evade her present attentive cavalier, and she skirted the fashionable crowd, drawing nearer to the doorway against which Sir Andrew was leaning. Why she wished to get closer to him, she could not have said. Perhaps she was impelled by an all-powerful fatality, which so often seems to rule the destinies of men. Suddenly she stopped. Her very heart seemed to stand still. Her eyes, large and excited, flashed for a moment towards that doorway. 
thin as quickly, uh, thin as quickly as were turned away again. Sir Andrew Folks was still in the same listless position by the door, but Marguerite had distinctly seen that Lord Hastings, a young buck, a friend of her uh, husband's and one of the princes said, had, as he quickly brushed past him, slipped something into his hand. For one moment longer, oh, it was the merest flash, Marguerite paused. The next she had, with admirably played unconcern, resumed her walk across the room but this time more quickly towards that doorway uh, whence Sir Andrew had now disappeared. All this from the moment that Marguerite had caught sight of Sir Andrew leaning against the doorway until she followed him into the little boudoir beyond had occurred in less than a minute. Fate is usually swift when she deals a blow. Now Lady Blakeney had suddenly ceased to exist, it was Marguerite Saint Just who was there only. Marguerite Saint Just, who had passed her childhood, her early youth, in the protecting arms of her brother Armand. She had forgotten everything else her rank, her dignity, her secret enthusiasms. Everything save that Armand stood in peril for his life, and that there, not twenty feet away from her, in the small boudoir, which was quite deserted at the very hands of Sir Andrew Folks, might be the talisman which would save her brother's life. Barely another thirty seconds had elapsed between that moment when Lord Hastings slipped the mysterious something into Sir uh, into Lord Hastings oh sorry into Sir Andrew's hand, and the one when she, in her turn, reached the deserted boudoir. Sir Andrew was standing with his back to her and close to a table upon which stood a massive silver candelabra. A slip of paper was in his hand, and he was in the very act of pursuing its con uh, perusing its contents. Hey, kickin', good to see you. Unperceived, her soft clinging robe making not the slightest sound upon the heavy carpet, not daring to breathe until she had accompanied her pur accomplished her purpose. Marguerite slipped close behind him. That moment he looked round and saw her. She uttered a groan, passed her hand across her forehead, and murmured faintly, oh, The heat in the room was terrible. I felt so faint. Oh. She tottered almost as if she would fall, and Sir Andrew, quickly recovering himself and crumpling in his hand the tiny note he had been reading, was only, apparently, just in time to support her. Are you are ill, Lordy, uh, Lady Blakeney? He asked with much concern. Let me... No, 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 it's nothing. She interrupted quickly. A chair. Quick. She sank into a chair close to the table and, throwing back her head, closed her eyes. There, she murmured still faintly. Oh, the giddiness is passing off. Do not heed me, Sir Andrew. I assure you, I already feel better. At moments like these, there is no doubt, and psychologists actually asserted, that there is in us a sense which has absolutely nothing to do with the, the other five. It is not that we see, it is not that we hear or touch, yet we seem to do all three at once. Marguerite sat there with her eyes apparently closed. Sir Andrew was immediately behind her, and on her right was the table with the five-armed candelabra upon it. Before her mental vision, there was absolutely nothing but Armand's face. Armand, whose life was in the most imminent danger, and who seemed to be looking at her from a background upon which were dimly painted the seething crowd of Paris, the bare walls of the Tribunal of Public Safety, with uh, Fouquier Tinville, the public persecutor, a uh, prosecutor, yeah, prosecutor, demanding Armand's life in the name of the people of France and the lurid guillotine with its stained knife waiting for another victim. Armand. For one moment there was dead silence in the little boudoir. Beyond, from the brilliant ballroom, the sweet notes of the gavotte, the frou-frou of rich dresses, the talk and laughter of a large and merry crowd came as a strange, weird accompaniment to the drama which was being enacted here. Sir Andrew had not uttered another word. Then it was that that extra sense became potent 
in Marguerite Blakeney. She could not see, for uh, her eyes were closed. She could not hear, for the noise from the ballroom drowned the soft rustle of that mysterious, uh, that momentous scrap of paper. Nevertheless, she knew, as if she had both seen and heard, that Sir Andrew was even now holding the paper to the flame of one of the candles. At the exact moment that it began to catch fire, she opened her eyes, raised her hand, and, with two dainty fingers, had taken the burning scrap of paper from the young man's hand. Then she blew out the flame and held the paper to her nostrils with perfect un unconcern. <clears throat> How thoughtful of you, Sir Andrew, she said gaily. Surely it was your grandmother who taught you that the smell of burnt paper was a sovereign remedy against giddiness. She sighed with satisfaction, holding the paper tightly between her jeweled fingers, that talisman which perhaps would save her brother Armand's life. Sir Andrew was staring at her too dazed for the moment to realize that what had actually happened. He had been taken so completely by surprise that he seemed quite unable to grasp the fact that this slip of paper which she held in her dainty hand was one perhaps on which the life of his comrade might depend. Marguerite burst into a long, merry peal of laughter. Why do you stare at me like that? she said playfully. I assure you I feel much better. Your remedy has proved most effectual. This room is most delightfully cool, she added, with the same perfect composure. And the sound of the gavotte from the ballroom is fascinating and soothing. She was prattling on in the most unconcerned and pleasant way, whilst Sir Andrew, in an agony of mind, was racking his brains and to the quickest method he could employ to get that bit of paper out of that beautiful woman's hand. Instinctively, vague and tumultuous thoughts rushed through his mind. He suddenly remembered her nationality, and worst of all, recollected that horrible tale anent the Marquis de Saint-Cyr, which in England no one had credited for the sake of Sir Percy, as well as for her own. What, still dreaming and staring, she said with a merry laugh. You are most ungallant, Sir Andrew. And I come to think of it, you seemed more startled than pleased when you saw me just now. I do believe, after all, that it was not concern for my health, nor yet a remedy taught you by your grandmother, that caused you to burn this tiny scrap of paper. I vow it must have been your lady love's last cruel epistle you were trying to destroy. Now confess, she added playfully, holding up the scrap of paper, does this contain her final cogne? Or a last appeal to kiss and make friends? Hi, Corel, good to see you. Whichever it is, La Lady Blakeney, said Sir Andrew, who was gradually becoming, uh, recovering his self-possession, this little note is undoubtedly mine, and not caring whether his action was one that would be styled ill-bred towards the lady, the young man had made a bold dash for the note, but Marguerite's thoughts flew quicker than his own. Her actions, under pressure of his intense excitement, were swifter and more sure. She was tall and strong. She took a quick step backwards and knocked over the small a Sheridan table, which was already top-heavy, and which fell down with a crash, together with a mastiff candelabra upon it. She gave a quick cry of alarm. The candle, Sir Andrew, quick! There was not much damage done. One or two of the candles had blown out as the candelabra fell. Others had merely sent some grease upon the valuable carpet. One had ignited the paper shade over it, Sir Andrew quickly and dexterously put out the flames and replaced the candelabra upon the table, but this had taken him a few seconds to do, and those seconds had been all that Marguerite needed to cast a quick glance at the paper and to note its contents, a dozen words in the same distorted handwriting she had seen before, and bearing the same device, a star-shaped flower drawn in red ink. When Sir Andrew once more looked at her, he only saw on her face alarm at the untoward accident and relief at its happy issue, whilst the tiny and momentous note, um, yeah, momentous note, had apparently fluttered to the ground. Eagerly, the young man picked it up, and his face looked much relieved as his fingers closely tight, uh, closed tightly over it. 
for shame, Sir Andrew, she said, shaking her head with a playful sigh, making havoc in the heart of some impressionable duchess, whilst conquering the affections of my sweet little Suzanne. Well, well, I do believe it was Cupid himself who stood by you and threatened the entire foreign office with destruction by fire, just on purpose to make me drop love's message before it had been polluted by my in indiscreet eyes. To think that a moment longer I might have known the secrets of an unerring, uh, of an erring duchess. You will forgive me, Lady Blakeney, said Sir Andrew, now as calm as she was herself. If I resume the interesting occupation which you had interrupted. By all means, Sir Andrew, how should I venture to thwart the love god again? Perhaps he would mete out some terrible chastisement against my per, uh, presumption. Burn your love token by all means. Sir Andrew had already twisted the paper into a long spill, and was once again holding it to the flame of the candle, which had remained alight. He did not notice the strange smile on the face of his fair vis-a-vis. -vis. So intent was he on the work of destruction. Perhaps he had done so. Uh, perhaps had he done so, the look of relief would have faded from his face. He watched the fateful note as it curled under the flame. Soon the last fragment fell on the floor, and he placed his heel upon the ashes. "'And now, Sir Andrew,' said Marguerite Blakeney, with the pretty nonchalance peculiar to herself, and with the most winning of smiles, "'you venture to excite the jealousy of your fair lady by asking me to dance the minuet?' "'Just going to take a moment to read the messages.' From the shadows behind you, a figure steps forth with glowing red eyes. His smile flashes with sharp white fangs. His gaze meets yours, and in a soft, calming voice he says, I greet thee from the realms of the darkness and shadows. Shall we adventure together for a while? <laughs> I like that message. You always come up with great greeting messages, Corral. I love them. And hello to you. I hope uh, your day has been going all right. Although it's about evening for you. All right. I am going to hide my straw again and continue. Chapter 13. Either or. Oh, you're awake now. I'm sorry. Or maybe yay? The few words which Marguerite Blakeney had managed to read on the half-scorched piece of paper seemed literally to be the words of fate. Start myself tomorrow. This she had read quite distinctly. Then came a blur caused by the smoke of the candle, which obliterated the next few words, but right at the bottom there was another sentence, which was now standing clearly and distinctly like letters of fire before her mental vision. If you wish to speak to me again, I shall be in the supper room at one o'clock precisely. The whole was signed with the hastily scrawled little device, this tiny star-shaped flower, which had become so familiar to her. It's kind of hard to see it uh, in there. Maybe we'll put there or there. We'll put that there. There we go. One o'clock precisely. It was now close upon eleven. The last minuet was being danced, and Sir Andrew Foulkes and beautiful Lady Blakeney leading the couples through this its de delicate and intricate figures. Close upon eleven, the hands of the handsome Louis Saint, uh, yeah, Louis Saint clock upon its or Malou bracket, seemed to move along with maddening rapidity. Two hours more, and her fate, and that of Armand, would be sealed. In two hours she must make up her mind whether she will keep the knowledge so cunningly gained to herself, and leave her brother to his fate, or whether she will willingly betray a brave man whose life was devoted to his fellow men, who was noble, generous, and above all, unsuspecting. 
It seemed a horrible thing to do, but then there was Armand. Armand, too, was noble and brave. Armand, too, was unsuspecting. And Armand loved her, would have willingly trusted his life in her hands, and now, when she could save him from death, she hesitated. Ugh, it was monstrous, her brother's kind, gentle face, so full of love and for her, seemed to be looking reproachfully at her. You might have saved me, Margot, he seemed to say to her, and you chose the life of a stranger, a man you do not know, whom you have never seen, and preferred that he should be safe whilst you sent me to the guillotine. All these conflicting thoughts raged through Marguerite's brain, while, with a smile upon her lips, she glided through the graceful mazes of the minuet. She noted, with that acute sense of hers, that she had succeeded in completely allaying Sir Andrew's fears. Her self-control had been absolutely perfect. She was a finer actress at that moment, and throughout the whole of this minuet, than she had ever been upon the boards of the Comédie Française. But then a beloved brother's life had not depended upon. Uh, but then a beloved brother's life had not depended upon her histrionic powers. She was too clever to overdo her part, and made no further allusions to the supposed billet doux, <clears throat> which had caused Sir Andrew Folk such an agonizing five minutes. She watched his anxiety melting away under her sunny smile, and soon perceived that, whatever doubt may have crossed his mind at the moment, she had, by the time the last bars of the minuet had been played, succeeded in completely dispelling it. He never realized in what a few, uh, fever of excitement she was, what effort it cost her to keep up a constant ripple of uh, banal conversation. When the minuet was over, she asked Sir Andrew to take her into the next room. I've promised to go down to supper with His Royal Highness, she said, but before we part, tell me, am I forgiven? Forgiven? Yes, confess I gave you a fright just now, but remember, I'm not an English woman, and I do not look upon the exchanging of billets doux as a crime, and I vow I'll not tell my little Suzanne, but now tell me, shall I welcome you to my water party on Saturday, uh, on Wednesday. I'm not sure, Lady Blakeney, he replied evasively. I may have to leave London tomorrow. I would not do that if I were you, she said earnestly, then seeing the anxious look upon his, uh, once more reappearing in his eyes, she added gaily, no one could throw a ball better than you can, Sir Andrew. We should so miss you on the bowling green. He had led her across the room to one beyond where already His Royal Highness was waiting for the beautiful Lady Blakeney. Madame, supper awaits us, said the prince. Supper at eleven o'clock. Is this me? Offering his arm to Marguerite, I am full of hope. The goddess fortune has frowned so persistently on me at hazard that I took uh, that I looked the confidence for the smiles of the goddess of beauty. "'Your Highness has been unfortunate at the card-table?' asked Marguerite as she took the prince's arm. "'I am most unfortunate. Blakeney, not content with being the richest among my father's subjects, is also the most of outrageous luck. By the way, where is that imit inimitable wit? I vow, madame, that his life would be but a... Uh, that this life would be but a dreary desert without your smiles and his sallies. Chapter 14. One o'clock precisely. Supper had been extremely gay. All those preset declared, um, oh, all those present, declared that never had Lady Blakeney been more adorable nor that demmed idiot Sir Percy more amusing. His Royal Highness had laughed until the heart, uh, the tears streamed down his cheeks at, Bla at Blakeney's foolish yet funny repartees. His doggerel verse, We seek him here, we seek him there, etc., was sung to the tune of Ho, Merry 
Britons, and to the accompaniment of glasses knocked loudly against the table. Lord Grenville, moreover, had a most perfect cook. Some wags asserted that he was a scion of the old French noblesse, who, having lost his fortune, had come to seek it in the cuisine of the foreign office. Marguerite Blakeney was in her most brilliant mood, and surely not a soul in that crowded supper-room had even an inkling of the terrible struggle which was waging within her heart. The clock was ticking so mercilessly on. It was long past midnight, and even the Prince of Wales was thinking of leaving the supper-table. Within the next half-hour the destinies of two brave men would be pitted against one another, the dreary uh, oh, the dearly beloved brother, and he, the unknown hero. Marguerite had not even tried to see Chauvelin during this last hour. She knew that his keen, fox-like eyes would terrify at her at once and incline the balance of her decision towards Armand. While she did not see him, there still lingered in her heart of hearts a vague, undefined hope that something would occur, something big, enormous, epoch-making, which would shift from her young, weak shoulders this terrible burden of responsibility, of having to choose between two such cruel alternatives. But the minutes ticked on with that dull monotony which they invariably seem to amuse when uh, seem to amuse when our very nerves ache with their incessant ticking. After supper, dancing was resumed. His Royal Highness had left, and there was a general talk of departing among the other guests. The young ones were indefatigable and had started on a no gabot, which would fill the next quarter of an hour. Marguerite did not feel equal to another dance. There is a limit to the most enduring self-control. Escorted by a cabinet minister, she had once more found her way to the tiny boudoir, still the most deserted among all the rooms. She knew that Chauvelin must be lying in wait for her somewhere, ready to seize the first possible opportunity for a tete-a-tete. -tete. His eyes had met hers for a moment after the four-supper minuet, and she knew that the keen diplomatist, with those searching pale eyes of his, had divined that her work was accomplished. Fate was, had willed it so. Marguerite, torn by the most terrible conflict heart of a uh, conflict heart of women can ever know, had resigned herself to its decrees. But Armand must be saved at any cost. He, first of all, for he was her brother, had been mother, father, friend to her ever since she, a tiny babe, had lost both her parents. To think of Armand dying a traitor's death on the guillotine was too horrible even to dwell upon. Impossible, in fact. That horrible, no, oh, that could never be, never. As for the stranger, the hero, well, there, let fate decide. Marguerite would redeem her brother's life at the hands of the relentless enemy, then let that cunning Scarlet Pimpernel extricate himself after that. Perhaps, vaguely, Marguerite hoped that the daring plotter, who for so many months had baffled an army of spies, would still manage to evade Chauvelin and remain immune to the end. She thought of all this as she sat listening to the witty discourse of the cabinet minister, who, no doubt, felt that he had found in Lady Blakeney a most a perfect listener. Suddenly she saw the keen fox-like face of Chauvelin peeping through the curtain doorway. Lord Fancourt, she said to the minister, will you do me a service? I am entirely at your ladyship's service, he replied gallantly. Will you see to my husband, uh, if my husband is still in the card room, and if he is, will you tell him that I am very tired and would be glad to go home soon? The commands of a beautiful woman are binding on all mankind, even on cabinet ministers. Lord Fancourt prepared to obey instantly. <clears throat> I do not like to leave your ladyship alone, he said. Never fear. 
I shall be quite safe here, and I think, uh, undisturbed. But I am really tired. I know Sir Percy will drive back to Richmond. It is a long way, and we shall not, and we do not hurry, get home before daybreak. Lord Fancourt had pre-forced to go. The moment he had disappeared, Chauvelin slipped into the room, and the next instant stood calm and impassive by her side. "'You have news for me?' he said. An icy mantle seemed to have suddenly settled around Marguerite's shoulders. Though her cheeks glowed with fire, she felt chilled and numbed. "'Oh, Armand, will you ever know the terrible sacrifice of pride, of dignity, of womanliness a devoted sister is making for your sake?' "'Nothing of importance,' she said, staring mechanically before him, uh, before her. "'But it might prove a clue. "'I contrive, uh, no matter how, to detect Sir Andrew Foulkes "'in a very act of burning a paper at one of these candles in this very room. "'That paper I succeeded in holding between my fingers for the space of two minutes "'and to cast my eye on it for that of ten seconds.' "'Time enough to learn its contents?' asked Chauvelin quietly. "'She nodded.' Then she continued in the same even mechanical tone of voice. In the corner of the pe paper there was the usual rough device of a small star-shaped flower. Above it I read two lines. Everything else was scorched and blackened by the flame. And what were these two lines? Her throat seemed suddenly to have contracted. For an instant she felt that she could not speak the words which might send a brave man to his death. It is lucky that the whole paper was not burned, added Chauvelin, with dry sarcasm, for it might have fared ill with Armand Saint Just. What were the two lines, Citoyenne? One was, I start myself tomorrow, she said quietly. The other, if you wish to speak to me, I shall be in the supper room at one o'clock precisely. Chauvelin looked up at the clock just above the mantelpiece. Then I have plenty of time, he said placidly. "'What are you going to do?' she asked. "'She was pale as a statue, but her hands were icy cold. "'Her head and heart throbbed with the awful strain upon her nerves. "'Oh, this was cruel, cruel! "'What had she done to have deserved all this? "'Her choice was made. "'She had done a vile action. "'Or uh, had she done a vile action? "'Or one that was sublime?' "'The recording angel who writes in the book of gold alone could give an answer what are you going to do she repeated mechanically oh nothing for the present after that it will depend on what on whom i shall see in the supper room at one o'clock precisely you will see the scarlet pimpernel of course but you do not know him no but i shall presently sir andrew will have warned him I think not. When you parted from him after the minuet, he stood and watched you for a moment or two, with a look which gave me to understand that something had happened between you. It was one, it was only natural, was it not, that I should make a shrewd guess as to the nature of that something. I, thereupon, engaged the young gallant in a long and animated conversation. We discussed, uh, discussed Herr Gluck's singular success in London until a lady claimed his arm for supper. Since then, I did not lose sight of him through supper, when we all came to upstairs again. Lady Portarlis uh, buttonholed him and started on the subject of pretty Mademoiselle Suzanne de Tournay. I knew he would not move until Lady Portarlis uh, Port had exhausted this, the subject, which will not be for another quarter of an hour at least, and it is five minutes to one now. He was preparing to go and went up to the doorway, where, drawing aside the curtain, he stood for a moment, pointing out to Marguerite the distant figure of Sir Andrew Foulkes in close conversation with Lady Portarlis. I think, he said with a triumphant smile, that I may safely expect to find this person I seek in the dining room, fair lady. There may be one, there may be more than one. Whoever is there, 
as the clock strikes one, will be shadowed by one of my men, and these, one, or, or perhaps two, or even three, will leave for France tomorrow. One of these will be the Scarlet Pimpernel. And I also, fair lady, will leave for France tomorrow. The papers found at Dover upon the person of Sir Andrew Fulkes speak of the neighborhood of Calais, of an inn which I know, uh, know well called Le Chat Gris, the Grey Cat, of a lonely place somewhere on the coast. The Père uh, Blanchard's hut, which I must endeavor to find. All these places are given as the point where this meddlesome Englishman has bidden the treasure, uh, the traitor de Tournay and others to uh, meet his emissaries. But it seems that he has decided not to send his emissaries, that he will start himself tomorrow. Now, one of those persons, whom I shall see anon in the supper room, will be journeying to Calais, and I shall follow that person until I have tracked him to where those fugitive aristocrats await him. For that person, fair lady, will be the man whom I have sought for for nearly a year, the man whose energy has un outdone me, whose ingenuity has baffled me, whose audacity has set me wondering, yes, me, who have been a trick or two in my, who have seen a trick or two in my time, the mysterious and elusive Scarlet Pimpernel. And Armand, she pleaded, have I ever broken my word? I promise you that the day that Scarlet Pimpernel and I start for France, I will send you that important letter of his to Special Courier, a by Special Courier. More than that, I will pledge you the word of France that the day I lay hands on that meddlesome Englishman, Saint Just will be here in England, safe in the arms of this charming sister. And with a deep and elaborate bow and another look at the clock, Chauvelin glided out of the room. It seemed to Marguerite that through all the noise, all the din of music, dancing and laughter, she could hear his cat-like tre uh, tread gliding through the vast reception rooms. But she could hear him go down the massive staircase, reach the dining room, and open the door. Fate had decided, had made her speak, had made her do a vile and indom abominable thing for the sake of the brother she loved. She lay back in her chair, passive and still, seeing the figure of her relentless enemy ever present before her aching eyes. <clears throat> when Chauvelin reached the supper room, it was quite deserted. It had that woebegone, forsaken, tawdry appearance which reminds one so much of a ba uh, ball dress the morning after. Half-empty glasses littered the table, unfolded napkins lay about, the chairs turned towards one another in groups of twos or threes, seemed like the seats of ghosts in close conversation with one another. There were two sets of two chairs, uh, there were sets of two chairs, very close to one another, in the far corners of the room, which spoke of recent whispered flirtations over cold game pie and champagne. There were sets of three or four chairs that were called pleasant, animated discussions over the latest scandal. There were chairs straight up in a row that still looked starchy, critical, acid, like antiquated dowagers. Uh, dowagers, sorry. There was a few isolated single chairs close to the table that spoke of gourmands intent on the most recherche dishes. Refound, I think, as the meaning and others overturned on the floor that spoke volumes on the subject of my Lord Grenville's cellars. It was like a ghost-like replica, in fact, of that fashionable gathering upstairs, a ghost that haunts every house where balls and good suppers are given. A picture drawn with white chalk on gray cardboard, dull and colorless, now that the bright silk dresses and gorgeously embroidered coats were no longer there to fill in the foreground, and now that the candles flickered sleepily on in their sockets. Chauvelin smiled benignly and rubbed his long, thin hands together. 
He looked round the deserted supper room, whence even the last flunky had retired in order to join his friends in the hall below. All was silence in the dimly lighted room, whilst the sound of the gavotte, the hum of distant talk and laughter, and the rumble of an occasional coach outside only seemed to reach his palace, uh, this palace of the sleeping beauty as the murmur of some flitting spooks far away. It all looked so peaceful, so luxurious, and so still that the keenest observer, a veritable prophet, could never have guessed that at this present moment that deserted supper room was nothing but a trap laid for the capture of the most cunning and audacious plot, uh, plotter those stirring times had ever seen. Chauvelin pondered and tried to peer into the immediate future. What would this man be like, whom he and the leaders of a whole revolution had sworn to bring to his death? Everything about him was weird and mysterious. His personality, which he had so cunningly concealed, the power he wielded over nineteen, uh, oh yeah, over nineteen English gentlemen who seemed to obey his every command, blindly and enthusiastically, the passionate love and submission he had roused in his little trained band, and above all, his mar marvelous audacity, the boundless impure, uh, impudence which had caused him to beard his most implacable enemies within the very walls of Paris. No wonder that in France the sobriquet of the mysterious Englishman roused in the people the superstitious shudder. Chauvelin himself, as he gazed round the deserted room, were presently the weird, uh, where presently the weird hero would appear felt a strange feeling of awe creeping all down his spine. But his plans were well laid. He felt sure that the Scarlet Pimpernel had not been warned, and felt equally sure that Marguerite Blakeney had not played false, uh, play, uh, had not played him false. If she had a cruel look that would have made her shudder, gleamed in Chauvelin's keen, pale eyes. If she had played him a trick, Armand Saint Just would suffer the extreme penalty. But no. Oh, of course she had not played him false. Fortunately, the supper room was deserted. This would make Chauvelin's task all the easier. When presently that unsuspecting enigma would enter alone, no one was here now save Chauvelin himself stay as he surveyed with a satisfied smile the solitude of the room. The cunning agent of the French government became aware of the peaceful, monotonous breathing of someone of, uh, of someone of my Lord Grenville's guests, who, no doubt, had supped both wisely and well, and was enjoying a quiet sleep away from the din of the dancing above. Chauvelin looked round once more, and there in the corner of a sofa, in the dark angle of the room, his mouth open, his eyes shut, the sweet sounds of peaceful slumber proceeding from his nostrils, recla reclined the gorgeously apparelled, long-limbed husband of the cleverest woman in Europe. Chauvelin looked at him as he lay there, placid, unconscious, at peace with all the world and himself, after the best of suppers, and a smile that was almost one of pity, softened for a moment the hard lines of the Frenchman's face and the sarcastic twinkle of his pale eyes. Evidently, the somber, deep in dreamless sleep, would not interfere with Chauvelin's trap for catching that cunning Scarlet Pimpernel. Again he rubbed his hands together, and, following the example of Sir Percy Blakeney, he too stretched himself out in the corner of another sofa, shut his eyes, opened his mouth, gave forth sounds of peaceful breathing, and waited. Chapter 15 Doubt Marguerite Blakeney had watched the slight sable-clad figure of Chauvelin as he worked his way through the ballroom. Then, perforce, she had had to wait while her nerves tingled with excitement. 
Listlessly, she sat in the small, still deserted boudoir, looking out through the curtained doorway on the dancing couples beyond. Looking at them, yet seeing nothing, hearing the music, yet conscious of naught save a feeling of expectancy, of anxious, weary waiting. Her mind conjured up for her the vision of what was, perhaps at this very moment, passing downstairs. The half-deserted dining room, the fateful hour, Chauvelin on the watch, then, precise to the moment, the entrance of a man, he, the Scarlet Pimpernel, the mysterious leader, who to Marguerite had become almost unreal. So strange and so weird was his hidden identity. She wished she were in the supper room, too, at this moment watching him as he entered. She knew that her woman's penetration would at once recognize in the stranger's face, whoever he might be, that strong individuality which belongs to a leader of men, to a hero, to the mighty high ro soaring eagle whose daring wings were becoming entangled in the ferret's trap. Womanlike, she thought of him with unmixed sadness. The irony of that fate seemed so cruel, which allowed the fearless lion to succumb to the gnawing of a rat. Ugh! Had Armand's life not been at stake? At stake. Faith, your ladyship must have thought me very remiss, said a voice suddenly close to her elbow. I had a deal of difficulty in delivering your message, for I could not find Blakeney anywhere at first. Marguerite had forgotten all about her husband and her message to him. His very name, as spoken by Lord Foncourt, sounded strange and unfamiliar to her so completely had she, in the last five minutes, lived her old life in the Rue de Richelieu again. With Armand always near her to love and protect her, to guard her from the many subtle intrigues which were forever raging in Paris in those days. I did find him at last, continued Lord Foncourt, and gave him your message. He said that he would give orders at once for the horse to be put to. Ah, she said, still very absently, found my husband and gave him my message. Yes, he was in the dining room, fast asleep. I could not manage to wake him up at first. Thank you very much, she said mechanically, trying to collect her thoughts. Will your ladyship honor me with a, a contradance until your coach is ready? Asked the Lord of Court. No, I thank you, my lord, but and you will forgive me. I really am too tired, and the heat in the ballroom has become oppressive. Conservatory is deliciously cool. Let me take you there and then get you something. You seem ailing, Lady Blakeney. I am only very tired, she repeated wearily, as she allowed Lord Fancourt to lead her, where subdued lights and green plants lent coolness to the air. He got her a chair into which she sank. This long interval of waiting was intolerable. Why did not Chauvelin come and tell her the result of his watch? Lord Foncourt was very attentive. She scarcely heard what he said, and suddenly startled him by asking abruptly, Look, Lord Foncourt, did you perceive who was in the dining room just now besides Sir Percy Blakeney? Only the agent of the French government, Monsieur Chauvelin, equally fast asleep in another corner, he said. Why does your ladyship ask? I, I know not. I, Did you notice the time when you were there? It must have been about five or ten minutes past one. I wonder what your ladyship is thinking about, he added, for evidently the fair lady's thoughts were very far away, and she had not been listening, uh, and she had not been listening to his intellectual conversation. But indeed, her thoughts were not very far away, only one story below, in this same house, in the dining room where sat Chauvelin still on the watch. Had he failed? For one instant, that possibility rose before her as a hope, the hope that the Scarlet Pimpernel had been warned by Sir Andrew, and that Chauvelin's trap had failed to catch his bird. But that hope soon gave way to fear. Had he failed? But then Armand. Lord Foncourt had given up talking since he found that he had no listener. He wanted an opportunity for slipping away. 
for sitting opposite to a lady, however fair, who was evidently not heeding the most vigorous efforts made for her entertainment, is not exhilarating, even to a cabinet minister. "'Shall I find out if your ladyship's coach is ready?' he said at last, tentatively. "'Oh, thank you, thank you, if you would be so kind. I fear I am but sorry company, but I am really tired, and perhaps would be best alone.' She had been lounging to be, uh, longing to be rid of him, for she hoped that, like the fox he so resembled, Chauvelin would be prowling round, thinking to find her alone. But Lord Foncourt went, and still Chauvelin did not come. Oh, what had happened? She felt Armand's fate trembling in the balance. She feared, now with a dread, uh, deadly fear, the Chauvelin had failed, and that the mysterious Scarlet Pimpernel had proved elusive once more. Then she knew that she need hope for no pity, no mercy from him. She had pronounced his either or, uh, and nothing less would, uh, he had pronounced his either or, and nothing less would content him. He was very spiteful and would affect the belief that she had wittingly misled him, and having failed to trap the eagle once again, his revengeful mind would be constant with the humble prey, uh, content with the humble prey, Armand. Yet she had done her best, had strained every nerve for Armand's sake. She could not bear to think that all had failed. She could not sit still. She wanted to go and hear the worst at once. She wondered even that Chauvelin had not yet come to vent his wrath and satire upon her. Lord Grenville himself came presently to tell her that her coach was ready and that Sir Percy was already waiting for her, ribbons in hand. Marguerite said farewell to her distinguished host. Many of her friends stopped her as she crossed the room to talk to her and exchange pleasant au revoirs. The minister only took final leave of beautiful Lady Blakeney on the top of the stairs. Below on the landing, a veritable army of gallant gentlemen were waiting to bid good-bye to the Queen of Beauty and Fashion, whilst outside, under the massive portico, Sir Percy's magnificent bays were impatiently pawning the ground. At the top of the stairs, just after she had taken final leave of her host, she suddenly saw Chauvelin. He was coming up the stairs slowly and rubbing his thin hands very softly together. There was a curious look on his mobile face, partly amused and wholly puzzled, and as his keen eyes met Marguerite, they became strangely sarcastic. Monsieur Chauvelin, she said as he stopped at the top of the stairs, bowing elaborately before her, my coach is outside, may I claim your arm? As gallant as ever, he offered his, her his arm and led her downstairs. The crowd was very great. Some of the minister's guests were departing, others were leaning against the banisters, watching the throng as it filed up and down the strange staircase, uh, the wide staircase. Chauvelin, she said at last desperately, I must know what has happened. What has happened, dear lady? he said with affected surprise. Where? When? You are torturing me, Chauvelin. I have helped you tonight. Surely I have a right to know what happened in the dining room at one o'clock just now. She spoke in a whisper, trusting that in the general hubbub of the crowd her words would remain unheeded by all, save the man at her side. Quiet and peace reigned supreme, fair lady. At that hour I was asleep in the corner of one sofa, and Sir, De uh, Sir Percy Blakeney in another. Nobody came into the room at all? Nobody. Then we have failed, you and I. Yes, we have failed. Perhaps. But Armand, she pleaded. Ah, Armand on just chances. Hang on a thread. Pray, heaven, dear lady, that that thread may not snap. Chauvelin, I worked for you sincerely, earnestly. Remember. I remember my promise, he said quietly. The day that the Scarlet Pimpernel and I meet on French soil, Saint-Just will be in the arms of his charming sister. Which means that a brave man's blood will be on my hands, she said with a shudder. His blood and that of your brother... 
Surely, at the present moment, you must hope, as I do, that the enigmatical Scarlet Pimpernel will start for Calais today. I am only conscious of one hope, Citoyen. And that is? That Satan, your master, will have need for you elsewhere before the sun rises today. <laughs> you flatter me, Citoyen. She had detained him for a while, midway down the stairs, trying to get at the thoughts which lay beyond his thin, uh, that thin fox-like mask. But Chauvelin remained urbane, sarcastic, mysterious. Not a line betrayed to the poor, anxious woman whether she need fear or whether she dared to hope. Downstairs on the landing, she had soon sur uh, was soon surrounded. Lady Blakeney never stepped from any house into her coach without an escort of fluttering human moths around the dazzling light of her beauty. But before she finally turned away from Chauvelin, she held out a tiny hand to him <clears throat> with that pretty gesture of childlike appeal which was so essentially her own. Give me some hope, my little Chauvelin, she pleaded. With perfect gallantry, he bowed over that tiny hand which looked so dainty and white through the delicately transparent black lace mitten and kissed the tips of her fingers. Pray heaven that the thread may not snap, he repeated with an enigmatic smile. And stepping aside, he allowed the moths to flutter more closely around the candle and the brilliant throng of the jeunes dorée, eagerly attentive to Lady Blakeney's every movement. Hid, uh, hid the keen fox-like face from her view. <clears throat> Sorry about all the throat clearing. Ain't allergies fantastic? Chapter 16, Richmond. A few minutes later, she was sitting wrapped in, a cozy, in, in cozy furs near Sir Percy Blakeney on the box seat of his magnificent coach, and the four splendid bays had thundered down the quiet street. The night was warm in spite of the gentle breeze which fanned Marguerite's burning cheeks. Soon, London houses were left behind, and rattling over old Hammersmith Bridge, Sir Percy was driving his bays rapidly towards Richmond. The river wound in and out in its pretty delicate curves, looking like a silver serpent beneath the glittering rays of the moon. Long shadows from overhanging trees spread occasionally deep palls right across the road. The bays were rushing along at breakneck speed, held up slightly back by Sir Percy's strong, unerring hands. These nightly drives after balls and suppers in London were a source of perpetual delight to Marguerite, and she appreciated her husband's eccentricity keenly, which caused him to adopt this mode of taking her home every night to their beautiful home by the river, instead of living in a stuffy London house. She loved driving his spirited horses along the lonely, moonlit roads, and she loved to sit on the box seat with the soft air of the English late summer's night fanning her face after the hot atmosphere of the ball of super, uh, supper party. The drive was not a long one, less than an hour, sometimes when the bays were very fresh and Sir Percy gave them full rein. Tonight he seemed to have a very a devil in his fingers, and the coach seemed to fly along the road beside the river. As usual, he did not speak to her, but stared straight in front of him, the ribbon seeming to lie quite loosely in his slender white hands. Marguerite looked at him tentatively once or twice. She could see his handsome profile and one lazy eye with its straight, fine brow and drooping, heavy lid. The face in the moonlight looked singularly earnest and recalled to Marguerite's aching heart those happy days of courtship before he had become the lazy nincompoop, the effete fop, whose life seemed spent in card and supper rooms. But now, in the moonlight, she could not catch the expression of the lazy blue eyes, 
She could only see the outline of the firm chin, the corner of the strong mouth, the well-cut massive shape of the forehead. Truly, nature had meant well by Sir Percy. His faults must all be laid at the door of that poor, half-crazy mother, and of the distracted, half-broken father, neither of whom had cared for the life, uh, young life which had sprouted up between them, and which, perhaps, their very carelessness was already beginning to work, uh, wreck. Marguerite suddenly felt intense sympathy for her husband. The moral crisis she had just gone through made her feel indulgent towards the faults, the delinquencies of others. How thoroughly a human being can be buffeted and overmastered by fate had been borne in upon her with appalling force. Had anyone told her a week ago that she would stoop to spy upon her friends, that she would betray a brave and unsuspecting man into the hands of a relentless enemy, she would have laughed the idea to scorn. Yet she had done these things, and on perhaps the death of that brave man would be at her door, just as two years ago the Marquis de Saint-Cyr had per perished through the thoughtless words of hers, but in that case she was morally innocent. She had meant no serious harm. Fate merely had stepped in, but this time she had done a thing that occasion uh, that obviously was base, had done it deliberately for a motive which perhaps high moralists would not even appreciate. And as she felt her husband's strong arm beside her, she also felt how much more she would dislike and despise her if he knew of this night's work. This human being judge of one, other, uh, one another superficially, casually, throwing contempt on one another with but little reason and no charity. She despised her husband for his inanities and vulgar intellectual occupation. And he, she felt, would despise her still worse because she had not been strong enough to do right for right's sake and to sacrifice her brother to the dictates of her con uh, conscience. Buried in her thoughts, Marguerite had found this hour in the breezy summer night all too brief, and it was with a feeling of keen disappointment that she suddenly realized that the bays had turned into the massive gates of her beautiful English home. Sir Percy Blakeney's house on the river had become a, a historic one. Palatial in its dimensions, it stands in the... Uh, midst of exquisitely laid out gardens with a picturesque terrace and frontage to the river. Built in Tudor days, the old red brick of the walls looked eminently picturesque in the midst of a bower of green, the beautiful dawn, uh, the beautiful lawn with its old sundial adding the true note of harmony to its foreground. Great secure trees lent cool shadows to the grounds, and now, on this warm early autumn night, the leaves slightly turned to russets and the gold uh, and gold, and the old garden looked singularly poetic and peaceful in the moonlight. Hey, sorry, Snockings was drinking my water. That is not your water. That is mine. Okay, just chill out. Stay in my lap. Thank you. I have to find my place. Sorry. Uh, we were talking about colors of... I am sorry I lost my place completely. Oh, well, I'll, I'll start here. With unerring precision, Sir Percy had brought the four bays to a standstill immediately in front of the fine Elizabethan entrance hall. In spite of the lateness of the hour, an army of grooms seemed to have emerged from the very ground as the coach had thundered up and were standing respectfully around. Sir Percy jumped down quickly, then helped Marguerite to alight. She lingered outside for a moment whilst he gave a few orders to one of his men. She skirted the house and stepped onto the lawn, looking out dreamily into the silvery, uh, silvery, yeah, silvery landscape. 
Nature seemed exquisitely at peace in comparison with the tumultuous eth- uh, emotions she had gone through. She could faintly hear the ripple of the river and the occasional soft and ghost-like fall of the dead leaf from a tree. All else was quiet round her. She had heard the horses prancing as they were being led away to the distant stables. The hurrying of servants' feet as they had all gone within to rest. The house also was quiet, uh, quite still. In two separate suits, uh, suites of apartments, just above the magnificent reception rooms, lights were still burning. They were her rooms, and his, well divided from each other by the whole width of the house, as far apart as her, their own lives had become. Involuntarily, she sighed. At that moment, she could really not have told why. She was suffering from inconquerable heartache. Deeply and achingly, she was sorry for herself. Never had she felt so pitiably lonely, so bitterly in want of comfort and of sympathy. With another sigh, she turned away from the river towards the house, vaguely wondering if, after such a night, she could ever find rest and peace and sleep. Suddenly, before she reached the terrace, she heard a firm step upon the crisp gravel, and the next moment her husband's figure emerged out of the shadow. He, too, had skirted the house and was wandering along the lawn towards the river. He still wore his heavy driving coat with the numerous lapels and collars he himself had set in fashion, but he had thrown it well back, burying his hands, as was his wont, in the deep pockets of his satin breeches. The gorgeous white costume he had worn at Lord Grendel's ball, with its jabot of priceless lates, looked strangely ghost-like against the dark background of the house. He apparently did not notice her, for, after a few moments' pause, he presently turned back towards the house and walked straight up to the terrace. Sir Percy! He already had one foot on the lowest of the terrace steps, but at her voice he started and paused, then uh, sorry, then looked searchingly into the shadows whence she had called to him. She came forward quickly into the moonlight, and as soon as he saw her, he said with an air of consummate gallantry he always wore when speaking to her, At your service, madame. But his foot was still on the step, and in his whole attitude there was a remote suggestion, distinctly visible to her, that he wished to go, and had no desire for a midnight interview. The air is deliciously cool, she said, the moonlight peaceful and poetic, and the garden inviting. Will you not stay in it a while? The hour is not yet late, or is my company so distasteful to you that you are in a hurry to rid yourself of it? Nay, madam, he rejoined placidly, but it uh, tis on the other foot the whole uh, the shoe happens to be, and I'll warrant you uh, you'll be the midnight air more poetic without my company. It's no doubt the sooner I remove the obstruction, the better your ladyship will like it. He turned once more to go. I protest you mistake me, Sir Percy, she said hurriedly, and drawing a little closer to him. The estrangement which, alas, has arisen between us was none of my making, remember. Begad, you must pardon me then, madame, he uh, protested coldly. My memory was always of the shortest. He looked her straight in the eye with that lazy nonchalance which had become second nature to him. She returned his gaze for a moment, then her eyes softened as she came up quite close to him to the foot of the terrace steps. Of the shortest, Sir Percy, faith, how it must have altered. Was it three years ago or four that you saw me for one hour in Paris on your way to the east? When you came back two years later, you had not forgotten me. She looked divinely pretty as she stood there in the moonlight, with the fur cloaks sliding off her beautiful shoulders, the gold embroidery on her dress shimmering around her, her childlike blue eyes turned up fully at him. He stood for a moment, rigid and still, but for the clenching of his hand against the stone balustrade of the terrace. "'You desired my presence, madame,' he said frigidly. "'I take it that it was not with a view to indulging in tender reminiscences?' 
His voice certainly was cold and uncompromising, his attitude before her stiff and unbending. Womanly decorum would have suggested that Marguerite should return coldness for coldness, and should sweep past him without another word, only with a curt nod of her head. But womanly instinct suggested that she should remain. That keen instinct, which makes a beautiful woman conscious of her powers, longs to bring to her knees the one man who pays her no homage. She stretched out her hand to him. <clears throat> Nay, Sir Percy, why not? The present is not so glorious, but that I should not wish to dwell a little in the past. He bent his tall figure, and taking hold of the extreme tip of the fingers which she still held out to him, he kissed them ceremoniously. "'I've faith, madame,' he said. "'Then you will pardon me if my dull wits cannot accompany you there.' Once again he attempted to go. Once more she voiced, uh, her voice, sweet, childlike, almost tender, called him back. "'Sir Percy, your servant, madame.' "'Is it possible that love can die?' she said with sudden, unreasoning vehemence. I thought that the passion which you once felt for me would outlast the span of human life. Is there nothing left of that love, Percy, which might help you to bridge over that sad estrangement? His massive figure seemed, while she spoke thus to him, to stiffen still more. The strong mouth hardened, a look of relentless obstinacy crept into the habitually lazy blue eyes. With what object, I pray you, madame, he asked coldly. I do not understand you. Yet tis simple enough, he said with sudden bitterness, which seemed literally to surge through his words, though he was making visible effort to suppress it. I humbly put the question to you, for my slow wits are unable to grasp the cause of this, your ladyship's sudden new mood. Is it that you have the taste to renew the devilish sport which you played so successfully last year? Do you wish to see me once more a lovesick supplicant at your feet, so that you might again have the pleasure of kicking me aside like a troublesome lapdog? She had succeeded in rousing him for the moment, and again she looked straight at him, for it was thus she remembered him a year ago. Percy, I entreat you, she whispered. Can we not bury the past? Pardon me, madame, but I understood you to say that your desire was to dwell in it. Nay, I spoke not of that past, Percy, she said, while a tone of tenderness crept into her voice. Rather did I speak of the time when you loved me still, and I oh, was vain and frivolous. Your wealth and position allured me. I married you, hoping in my heart that your great love for me would beget in me a love for you, but alas. The moon had sunk down below the bank of clouds. In the east, a soft gray light was beginning to chase away the heavy mantle of the night. He could only see her graceful outline now. <clears throat> the small queenly head with its wealth of reddish golden curls and the glittering gems forming the small star-shaped red flower which she wore as a diadem in her hair. Twenty-four hours after our marriage, madame, the Marquis de saint Cyr and all his family perished on the guillotine, and the popular rumour reached me that it was the wife of Sir Percy Blakeney who helped to send them there. Nay, I myself told you the truth of that odious tale, not till after it had been recounted to me by strangers with all its horrid details. And you believe them, then, and there, she said, with great vehemence, without a proof of que or question. You believe that I, whom you vowed you loved more than life, whom you professed you worshipped, that I could do a thing so base as these strangers chose to recount. You thought I meant to deceive you about it all, that I ought to have spoken before I married you, yet... Had you listened, I would have told you that up to the very morning on that on which Saint Cyr went to the guillotine, I was straining every nerve using my influence I possessed to save him and his family. But my pride sealed my lips when your love seemed to perish as if under the knife of that same guillotine. Yet I would have told you how I was duped, I, 
I, whom that same popular rumor had endowed with the sharpest wit in France, I was tricked into doing this thing by men who knew how to prey upon my love for an only brother and my desire for revenge. Was it unnatural? Her voice seemed, became choked with tears. She paused for a moment or two, trying to regain some sort of composure. She looked appealingly at him, almost as if he were her judge. He had allowed her to speak on in her own vehement, impassioned way, offering no comment, no word of sympathy. And now, while she paused, trying to swallow down the hot tears that gushed her, her eyes, he waited, impassive and still. The dim gray light of early dawn seemed to make his tall form look taller and more rigid. The lazy, good-natured face looked strangely altered. Marguerite, excited as she was, could see that the eyes were no longer languid, the mouth owned no longer good-humored and inane. A curious look of intense passion seemed to glow from beneath this dro his drooping lids. The mouth was tightly closed, the lips compressed, as if the will alone held that surging passion in check. Marguerite Blakeney was, above all, a woman with all a woman's fascinating foibles, all a woman's most lovable sins. She knew in a moment that for the past few months she had been mistaken, that this man who stood here before her, cold as a statue, when her musical voice struck upon his ear, loved her as he had loved her a year ago, that his passion might have been dormant, but that, would, that it was there, as strong, as intense, as overwhelming as when first her lips met his in one long, maddening kiss. Pride had kept him from her, and, womanlike, she meant to win back that conquest which had been hers before. Suddenly it seemed to her that the only happiness life would ever hold for her again would be in feeling that man's kiss once more upon her lips. Listen to the tale, Sir Percy, she said, and her voice now was low, sweet, infinitely tender. Armand was all uh, in all to me. We had no parents and brought one another up. He was my little father and I, his tiny mother. We loved one another so. And one day, do you mind me, Percy? The Marquis de Saint-Cyr had my brother Armand thrashed, thrashed by his lackeys, that brother whom I loved better than all the world, and his offense that he, a plebeian, had dared to love the daughter of the aristocrat, for that he was waylaid and thrashed thrashed like a dog within an inch of his life. Oh, how I suffered, this humiliation he'd eaten into my very soul. When the opportunity occurred and I was able to take my revenge, I took it, but I only thought to bring that proud Marquis to trouble and humiliation. He plotted with Austria against his own country. Chance gave me knowledge of this. I spoke of it, but I did not know. How could I guess? They trapped and duped me. When I realized what I had done, it was too late. It is perhaps a little difficult, madam, said per Sir Percy, after a moment of silence between them, to go back over the past. I have confessed to you that my memory is short, but the thought certainly lingered in my mind that, at the time of the Marquis's death, I entreated you for an explanation of these same noise and popular rumors. If that same memory does not, even now, Play me a trick, I fancy, that you refused me all explanation then, and demanded of my love and humiliating allegiance to uh, it was not prepared to give. I wished to test your love for me, and it did not bear the test. You used to tell me that you drew the very breath of life but for me and for love of me. And to probe that love, you demand that I should forfeit mine honor, he said, whilst gradually his impassively... His impassiveness seemed to leave him, his rigidity to relax. That I should accept without murmur or question, as a dumb and submissive slave, every action of my mistress. My heart overflowing with love and passion, I asked for no explanation. I waited for one, not doubting, only hoping. Had you spoken but one word from you, I would have accepted my, any explanation and believed it. But you left me without a word beyond a bald confession of the actual horrible facts, 
proudly you returned to your brother's house and left me alone for weeks, not knowing now in whom to believe, since the shrine which contained my one illusion lay shattered to earth at my feet. She need not complain now that she that he was cold and impassive. His very voice shook with intensity of passion, which he was making superhuman efforts to keep in check. I, the madness of my pride, she said sadly. Hardly had I gone, already I had repented, but when I returned I found you oh, so altered, wearing already that mask of somnolent indifference which you have never laid aside until until now. She was so close to him that her soft, loose hair was wafting against his cheek. Her eyes, glowing with tears, maddened him. The music in her voice sent fire through his veins. But he would not yield to the magic charm of this woman who he had so deeply loved, and at whose hands his pride had suffered so bitterly. He closed his eyes to shut out the dainty vision of that sweet face, of that snow-white neck and graceful figure, round which the faint rosy light of dawn was just beginning to hover playfully. Nay, madam, it is no mask, he said icily. I swore to you once that my life was yours. For moments now it has been your plaything. It has served its purpose. But now she knew that that, was, that very coldness was a mask. The trouble, the sorrow she had gone through last night suddenly came back to her mind, but no longer with bitterness, rather with a feeling that this man who loved her would help her to bear the burden. Sir, Pol Sir Percy, she said impulsively, heaven knows you had been at pains to make the task which I had set to myself terribly difficult to accomplish. You spoke of my mood just now. Well, we will call it that, if you will. I wish to speak to you because because I was in trouble and had need of your sympathy. It is yours to command, madame. How cold you are, she sighed. Faith, I can scarce believe that but a few mo months ago one tear in my eye would have sent well you well nigh crazy. Now I come to you with a half-broken heart and, and I pray you, madame, he said, whilst his voice shook almost as much as hers, what way can I serve you? Percy, Armand is in deadly danger. A letter of his, rash impetuous as were all his actions, and written to Sir Andrew Foulkes, has fallen into the hands of a fanatic. Armand is hopelessly compromised. Tomorrow, perhaps, he will be arrested. After that, the guillotine, unless... Oh, it's horrible she said with a sudden wail of anguish and all of the events of the past night uh, the past night came rushing back to her mind horrible you do not understand you cannot and and i have no one to whom i can turn for help or even for sympathy tears now refused to be held back all her trouble her struggles the awful uncertainty of armand's fate overwhelmed her she tottered, ready to fall, and leaning against the stone balustrade, she buried her face in her hands and, and sobbed bitterly. At first mention of Armand Saint Just's name and of the peril in which he stood, Sir Percy's face had become a shade more pale, and the look of determination and obstinacy appeared more marked than ever between his eyes. However, he said nothing for the moment, but watched her as her delicate frame was shaken with sobs watched her until unconsciously his face softened, and what looked almost like tears seemed to glisten in his eyes. And so, he said with bitter sarcasm, the murderous dog of the revolution is turning upon the very hands that fed it. Begad, madam, he added very gently, as Mad Marguerite continued to sob hysterically. You will dry your tears? I never could bear to see a pretty woman cry, and I, instinctively, with sudden overmastering passion at sight of her helplessness and of her grief he stretched out his arms and the next would have seized her and held her to him protected from every uh, evil that with, uh, with his very life his very heart's blood 
but pride had the better of it in this struggle again, once again. He restrained himself with a tremulous effort of will and said coldly, though still very gently, Will you not turn to me, Marguerite, and tell me in what way I may have the honor to serve you? She made a violent effort to control herself, and turning her tear-stained face to him, she once more held out her hand, which he kissed with the same pu uh, punctish, uh, punctilious gallantry. But Marguerite's fingers had this time lingered in his hand for a second or two longer than was absolutely necessary, and this was because she had felt that his hand trembled perceptibly and was burning hot, whilst his lips felt as cold as marble. Can you do aught for Armand? she said sweetly and simply. You have so much influence at court, so many friends. Nay, madame, should you not rather seek the influence of your French friend, Monsieur Chauvelin? His extends, if I mistake not, even as far as the Republican government of France. I cannot ask him, Percy. Oh, uh, I wished I dared to tell you, but... but he has put a price on my brother's head, which she would have given word, uh, worlds if she had felt the courage then to tell him everything, all she had done that night, how she had suffered and how her hand had been forced. But she dared not, uh, dared not give way to that impulse, not now, when she was just beginning to feel that he still loved her, and she hoped that she could win him back. She dared not make another confession to him, after all. He might not understand. He might not sympathize with her struggles and temptation. His love still dormant might sleep the sleep of death. Perhaps he divined what was passing in her mind. His whole attitude was one of intense longing, a veritable player for that confidence which her foolish pride withheld from him. When she remind, uh, remained silent, he sighed, and said with marked coldness, Faith, madam, since it distresses you, you will not speak of it. Uh, we will not speak of it. As for Armand, I pray you have no fear. I pledge you my word that he shall be safe. Now have I your permission to go. The hour is getting late, and will at least accept my gratitude, she said, as she drew quite close to him, and speaking with real tenderness. With a quick, almost involuntary effort, he would have taken her then in his arms, for her eyes were swimming in tears, which he longed to kiss away. But she had lured him at once, just like this, then cast him aside like an ill-fitting glove. He thought this was but a mood, a caprice, and he was too proud to lead, uh, lend himself to it once again. "'It is too soon, madame,' he said quietly. I have done nothing yet. The hour is late, and you must be fatigued. Your women will be waiting for you upstairs. He stood aside to allow her to pass. She sighed a quick sigh of disappointment. His pride in her beauty had been in direct conflict, and his pride had remained the conqueror. Perhaps, after all, she had deceived just uh, now. What she took to be the light of love in his eyes might only have been the passion of pride or, who knows, of hatred instead of love. She stood looking at him for a moment or two longer. He was again as rigid as impassive as before. Pride had conquered, and he cared not for her. The gray of dawn was gradually yielding to the most rosy of the rising sun. Birds began to twitter. Nature awakened, smiling in happy response to the warmth of this glorious October morning. Only between these two hearts there lay a strong, impassable barrier, built up of pride on both sides, which neither of them cared to be the first to demolish. He had bent his tall figure in a low, ceremonious bow, as she finally, with another bitter little sigh, began to mount the terrace steps. The long train of her gold-embroidered gown swept the dead leaves off the steps, making a faint, harmonious shh, shh, as she glided up, with one hand resting on the balustrade, the rosy light of dawn making an areola of gold round her hair. Now, that's a, a halo. 
and causing the rubies on her head and arms to sparkle. She reached the tall glass doors which led into the house. Before entering, she paused once again to look at him, hoping against hope to see his arms stretched out to her and to hear his voice calling her back. But he had not moved. His massive figure looked the very personification of unbending pride and fierce obstinacy. Hot tears again surged to her eyes, and as she would not let him see them, she turned quickly within and ran as fast as she could up to her own rooms. Had she but turned back then and looked out once more onto the rose-lit garden, she would have seen that which would have made her own sufferings seem but light and easy to bear. A strong man overwhelmed with his own passion and his own despair. Pride had given way at last. Obstinacy was gone. The will was powerless. He was but a man madly, blindly, passionately in love, and as soon as her light footsteps had died away within the house, he knelt down upon the terrace steps, and in the very madness of his love he kissed one by one the places where her small foot had trodden, and the stone balustrade there where her tiny hand had rested last. All right, that was actually super fabulous timing. Uh, we've come to the end of the chapter, and uh, four minutes before the end of, oh, sorry, uh, scheduled end of story time. Uh, so I don't. Um, if you're not on my Discord, um, you probably, or no, maybe I don't know. I might have said on Twitter as well. Uh, but yesterday was my one year anniversary of starting my story time stream, and so I am actually in um, in conversation with Polly Swags. We're going to do a co stream to celebrate that, combined with um, the. Uh, affiliate celebration and the 100, uh, 100 plus followers. I think we're at 124 right now, which is, I'm very impressed actually <laughs> to think that a uh, story time stream would have so many uh, followers and like people who, even if they're not able to watch while I'm streaming, can go watch the, the, uh, VODs and uh, and the YouTube videos. So, you know, I'm just really glad because I have always loved reading aloud for about, I've been doing it for about 25 years, actually. Uh, I was about 15 when I started reading to Walkie, who was my first cat. And Maestro also enjoyed it for a time, and then he got upset because I read a book that uh, made him jealous. It was called Homer's Odyssey. Um, but anyways, yeah, um, we are planning on doing that about uh, the 18th, which is going to be a Monday, starting at uh, my usual time of 2 Pacific time. And uh, I'm thinking of doing a Dota 2 stream. Uh, I chose Dota 2 because it is a multiplayer game, free to play, anybody can uh, join in, and I wanted to do something that anybody could, uh, you know, join in. We could do some quests or something. I haven't quite uh, like started playing it to see what the gameplay is like and what a good starting level would be. So, you know, you could like work up to level five or something like that. Um, anyways, yeah. So this week, I know this month's schedule is a bit weird since we don't have the uh, same schedule for the whole month. This week, uh, the next story time is going to be Thursday. Yes, Thursday the 7th, 2 to 4, of course. And we're continuing with the Scarlet Pimpernel. And I have planned for, um, I don't know what I'm going to do after the Scarlet Pimpernel, but sometime in February, I'm planning on reading The Heroic Slave by Fred Frederick Douglass. Uh, it is his one and only fiction that he has written. He has written a couple of non-fictions. And then in March, I am planning on doing uh, Nellie Bly. She is the uh, 
the woman who worked for uh, a reporter for the paper, a female reporter for the paper, uh, in the late 1800s, I believe it was. Uh, and I have coming in the Around the World in 72 Days, where she tries to beat um, Jules Verne. Was it Jules Verne's? Yeah, I think so. Jules Verne's record of the 80 days from his fictional novel Around the World in 80 Days. And then she also has a mystery. I think it's the um, the mystery of Central Park or something like that. I'm, I don't really remember. But uh, that was a serialized mystery that she did, uh, did in the newspaper. So we'll do one of those two. And then after that, I'm not really sure what we're going to do. Um, anyways, let's go and find somebody to raid. Do you have any uh, requests or suggestions? It looks like Polly Swags is streaming right now. Or actually, is... Oh, okay, sorry. I, I thought that um, obviously Bedtime was doing a stream, but he's doing a watch party, which is not something we can raid because that is on uh, Discord. So let us open up our... All right, so we have Shiny Wave. Ooh. Oh, okay, obviously Bedtime is doing um, Magic the Gathering and also a watch party. Polly Swags is... Um, okay. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me, Corral. Uh, thanks for being here. It's always great seeing you. Uh, let's see. We have Swags is doing Sunday Fun Day. Silverstorm, Tetraton. It has, uh, let's see, Curie or Shiny Wave. Which shall we do? I think we will do, actually we'll do Shiny Wave, because I don't think I have uh, rated her in a little while. She is doing Stardew Valley, which has had um, a an update recently, which is really cool. Is this, no, it's not that one. Sorry about this. There we go. Alright, so next uh, stream for sure, or yeah, is going to be on Thursday. We will continue with the Scarlet Pimpernel, and I hope to see you then. If not, I'll see you later. Have a great week.